I'm now going to introduce you to the perfect man to talk to you about mining. Um, he's perfect in two respects. One is that for a long time um, he uh, organized the ICMM, which is a, as he'll explain, is a grouping of, is a grouping of pretty well all the major mining companies um, from around the world. Um, but the other feature in which he's unique is that he's just stepped down. And so he's now a free and independent voice. So he's not speaking on behalf of ICMM. He's in a position to give an honest and informed and unvarnished view. Um, so, Tom, um, let's hear from you, not from me. Thanks, Paul, for the introduction, and it's it's great to be with you. And yes, it's uh, it's great to have an independent voice uh, after six years actually in the role. Um, a little bit of uh, background on ICMM. It's uh, it's a membership organisation, as you said, of companies from around the world with a nice balance in terms of commodities, everything from gold to, to nickel to to coal to cobalt to copper, um, but also a nice balance in terms of where the, the companies come from. So there's a nice sort of north south balance and also um, between developing and developed countries. And, uh, and as a result, uh, uh, you know, could be considered to have a sort of truly global perspective in terms of the, the issues um, uh, that the members are grappling with. And the purpose of the organization um, is to enhance the environmental and social impact of um, member companies and, and by extension, and hopefully by example, the industry. And the, 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 the underlying rationale for setting up the organization in the first place was to, um, to make sure that uh, the, the company stayed on the cutting edge in terms of uh, their approach to environmental and social issues, because they were worried uh, when the organization was founded that if they didn't do that, then uh, ultimately they would begin to lose access to projects, capital and markets. And that's still the, the, the driving rationale for the organization and why it exists today. Suppose I was the, you know, the Minister of Mines or the President of a poor country in Africa, and, um, and I'd seen uh, some other African country which had managed to get big revenues from mining. Um, and, uh, and I wanted to know um, what determines whether, whether you'll come. Um, by now, um, the, the, the people who are knocking at the door are the Chinese, um, but um, I've had a number of African ministers say to me, um, we really want a little bit of diversification from dependence on China. Um, and yeah. so attracting you in um, is potentially very attractive, um, but it's all about allocation of capital. What, 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 is, what is a company, a mining company looking for? The, the key thing for um, governments to keep in mind is that, is that the CEO considering an investment in, in you know, a particular country is, um, is going to have to answer to the shareholders, to the providers of capital, a number of questions. And um, the first question, of course, is, is this, is this project um, going to make sense is it going to deliver a return that is that is on a risk-adjusted basis acceptable uh, to the the providers of capital? And um, you know, one one very obvious question that they'll be asking is, well, what is the the, the fiscal regime? Uh, you know, what are the particular taxes that are going to apply to this project? And you know, if the if the price of the particular commodity turns out as as predicted, what are the returns likely to look at? But they'll also look at a much broader range of um, aspects. So. Um, you know, a, a big question is always, what is the company's track record for dealing with other companies? And, you know, how do they make decisions? You know, are decisions made in a consistent way? Um, does the country have a track record of, of predictability, uh, transparency? Are companies treated fairly? And is there a sort of level playing field between different companies? Um, they'll be wanting to know whether there are clear processes for not just decisions on on tax matters, but decisions on permitting, uh, you know, the, your environmental and social permits, your you know the other permits that would be required before you can operate. Um, they'll ask, um, you know, uh, how engaged the the government is with the the private sector. 
and um, you know, is if a company goes into a, a country, is its voice going to be heard? Is it going to be consulted on um, you know key decisions which are going to impact it? And of course, security of title matters. You know, is there is there a risk um, based on track record that if you know if you invest in in a country that you might lose the uh, deposit down the road or lose the asset down the road? Uh, is corruption a big concern? Uh, you know, how does the rule of law work? So, you know, all of these uh, considerations, and then you know, the other consideration that uh, companies have is um, uh, operational questions, like uh, you know, what do the logistics look like? Um, how far away is this deposit from the coast? Um, is there existing uh, rail or road infrastructure? Um, who's going to uh, control that? Is that is that going to be something the company has to build, or is that something where, you know, the government is going to be able to to assist or come to the table? And um, how how will critical assets um, be controlled? You know, how reliable is energy? You know, can you count on uh, um, a, um, a, a a regular supply of electricity if you're building a smelter, for example? That's critical because. If your electricity supply goes down for more than a few hours, you can end up uh, spending six six months, you know, fixing the the pots in a smelter. So those are the kind of questions that will be in the minds of um, of uh, of CEOs that because they know they have to answer those questions to their own shareholders. So thanks, Tom. There's, there's really two essential points there. I think one is that um, these uh, these companies uh, are themselves answerable. Uh, to people who provide the finance. Um, they're not free agents. Um, yeah. uh, they're, they're held to account, very much held to account, by the people who are allocating the finance, um, who are often themselves not owners of the finance, but themselves acting on behalf of a pensioners or whatever. Um, yes. um, the, um, and the other point is that um, uh, a mine is sinking a huge amount of investment, and then there's a potential problem of what in economics is called a hold-up, um, uh, that uh, uh, having been lured in, um, uh, then um, that somebody laughs and says, we've got you over a barrel now, and we're changing the rules. Um, and that you'll be, so that the, the government will be judged by to what extent is it being a, a predictable an environment in which um, behavior has been reasonable. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be reasonable. Yeah. Um, and now let's turn and look from the government's perspective, because the government has different interests uh, from, uh, from a mining company. Um, uh, it's not interested in providing the perfect environment for a mining company. It's interested in um, getting uh, revenues, jobs, um, and any other benefits that a, that a mining operation can come up with. So let, let's focus on it from the government's point of view. And what can a mining company offer that is sort of consistent with its own sort of red lines? Yeah, I think that's I think that's interesting, um, Paul. And I think actually there's a lot of overlap between um, you know what what the government wants and what um, a company wants. So, for example, I mean you mentioned jobs, and uh, from a from a company's point of view, uh, they're often concerned about you know are, is there you know sufficient availability of the, the right kind of skills in the country, or am I going to have to bring in a lot of expatriates to to run the mine? So. The sooner that the if the, if those kind of skills don't exist in a country, the sooner that those um, that people local people can be trained up, the better from the company's perspective. Because you know then they won't have to bring in expatriates who tend to be very expensive and and you know significantly impact the overheads of the the mine. And uh, you know from the from the company's perspective, the more local people they employ, it's also um, uh, you know delivering on the on the on the promise to the host country. And it's a it's a significant risk mitigation. You know, it's um, it's 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 rather easier to consider uh, holding up a company which is run entirely uh, by by expats and 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 delivering no sort of visible jobs to um, to the host country. And I think um, you know, there's also um, you know, there are there are a number other uh, of other areas of potential overlap. So one is um, 
not just delivering um, direct jobs, but delivering indirect jobs through capacity building and through local procurement of, um, in particular, of SMEs, small and medium sized enterprises. Um, and there's there's a lot of overlap there as well, because that's something, you know, from the from the government's point of view, um, the, the multiplier can often often be as, as high as 25 to 1. So, you know, that means for every direct job, you can see uh, 25 indirect jobs being created. But you need to work at that. And that that, that requires partnership um, between uh, the company and the government. You need to make sure that you've got the, you know, the, the right sort of regulatory aspects in place for the creation of, of small companies, that, that small companies, um, you know, are... Uh, aren't sort of bound up by red tape and that they're, they're you know, able to operate. And, um, you know, from a company's point of view, uh, they need to come to the table and, and, and make an effort, uh, for example, to, um, to chop up contracts into, into bite-sized morsels that, um, you know, local companies can handle. Um, but, they, you know, when it's done right, you, you, you can re- see that it's really transformative. So, for example, uh, Newmont in, in Ghana um, had created something like 30,000 um, jobs by fostering um, SMEs and 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 by the way focusing on on gender and encouraging women-owned SMEs. Uh, the final thing to mention is shared infrastructure, and you know there's there's enormous potential for companies to anchor infrastructure, which then can benefit other um, mines and and indeed other sectors. So uh, you know, for example, ports, uh, railways. Um, energy. If you can, if you can anchor a new power plant, which is also going to supply um, other factories or a local town, um, you know those benefits can be very high as well. And 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 companies um, are very keen on exploring those opportunities because all of all of that helps with their social license to operate, which in turn helps with um, long term risk mitigation. Yes, I, I think that infrastructure agenda. Um, is really potentially the most exciting because um, uh, often the mines are in somewhere that's a little bit remote um, uh, and so doesn't have electricity, doesn't have good access to markets and so on. Um, uh, and by providing, by overbuilding the infrastructure so it can be shared more widely, um, it really opens up a, a, a lot of potential for for people to, to, to create new businesses that don't, don't just supply the mine, or maybe don't supply the mine at all, but use the, the infrastructure. And that, that seems to me a lot of potential. Let's, let's turn finally to uh, another touchy issue, uh, which, is, which is tax. Um, and um, a distinctive feature of mining is that um, what's usually being extracted is an ore, um, and uh, ores don't have um, immediately verifiable um, uh, prices because it depends what's in the ore. Um, yeah. And so that creates a lot of complications. Have you any thoughts on that? Well, I think it is an issue still. I think part of the, um, part of the challenge is this, um, you know, companies um, often have you know marketing arms um you know in a different country and so they have to set up internally within the within the company um uh, you know marketing fees or or service fees which are supposed to be on an arm's length basis and um uh the the challenge is that that is that is a very sort of subjective question and governments um can take a very different view about you know what's an acceptable um, arm, arm's length deal, and um, or, or, or you know obviously and justifiably in in some cases nervous that they're being ripped off because uh, you know the, the the marketing arrangements are not uh, not being done at arm's length, and the challenge also is that you know that it it takes a lot of capacity, and um, you know the ability to sort of um, get to to clarity and get to a fair ruling on that um, is is a challenge for for governments because if you're up against a multinational that is doing um, you know operations in twenty countries and having to sort of manage these kind of arrangements in in twenty or thirty countries, um, they they're going to have um, access to a lot a lot more lawyers and capacity than the the host country. So I think I do think that there you know there are existing 
um, entities in Africa that uh, help out with this. There's the Africa Development Bank, for example, has a, um, a, a, a legal team that offers um, resources to, to countries to help them with this. And I think it's um, you know, it behoves the, the companies to try and do this as fairly as possible. But you know, ultimately, it, it is going to be a source of tension because uh, even if a company you know is is trying in good faith uh, to do things the right way, um, you could put a few people in a room and they'll all come to a different view as to whether you know that's fair. Uh, so it will be an ongoing source of tension. I, th- I think the other point to make is that uh, you know companies. Um, have over the years recently um recent years sort of come under a lot of pressure to get rid of um any um tax haven subsidiaries and to uh you know to pay taxes in in the in the country where the economic benefits are being produced or the product is being produced and uh, by and large i think they've done a relatively good job on that compared to other sectors so for example you know the digital sector is notorious for for not paying taxes in in developing countries and so in terms of the allocation of effort by host countries um there's there's a little bit of an 80 20 rule and um you know whether y- y- you could spend a lot of time and effort going after the last 20 percent um or you could start um trying to broaden your tax base and and work out you know who else should be paying tax in your country who's who's maybe not paying anything at all today that, that's really helpful i think the uh the, the, I, I, I always advise governments to um, tax what you can observe, um, and if you're going to ob- if you're going to tax it, you better build the capacity to observe it. Um, if you tax something you can't observe, you've already got your answer, um, and that applies not just to uh, mining. It applies in Britain. It applied to a company selling coffee in a cups. <laughs> so um, uh, it's a it's a pervasive problem. Um, but it's it's very useful to let me close here. But it, it's it's about understanding the areas where there are sort of irreducible tensions, and seeing those in a context where there are also areas where there's a lot of rather easy scope for mutual benefit. And um, I think it's the it's important not to exaggerate the the importance of sort of in principle fights on, as you say, the sort of 20 percent, um, uh, elusive 20 percent, um, uh, get to the 80, but then uh, look to all these areas where there's scope for mutual benefit. And so the, the struggles need to be set, they need to be fought, but they need to be fought in the context of this huge domain where there's mutual benefit. Yes, and I think trust, Paul. I would say I, I would say trust is key, and in order to um, develop trust, to encourage as much dialogue as possible between government and the private sector, so that so that each side understands the perspectives of the other, so that and 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 foster vehicles for this dialogue. Um, you know, the EITI is a great example. They have uh, country level working groups in in countries which have signed up to the EITI, and those working groups are a great vehicle in a forum for. Uh, understanding and dialogue between government, private sector, and of course civil society who also represented on those groups. So um, those I would I was you know maybe close by saying uh, in, encourage those kind of vehicles, encourage that kind of dialogue because ultimately um, if if you can close the trust gap, that will be better for all sides. Tom, thank you very much. When we hold our course in person, um, people from both sides come up for a week, and day one they look across the room at the at the enemy and try and see the horns coming out of their ears you know um and by the end of the week they've <laughs> they're all friends and they've realized they've got a common struggle on their hands and um, and so trust building can be done in many different ways but one is just getting together physically and seeing that um, neither side actually has horns coming out of its head thank you very much tom Thank you, Paul. It's been a pleasure and I look forward to uh, coming together in person as well.